The following program is a PodcastOne.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. Chris Jericho, Y2J, sitting right in front of me. Jesus, he's crashed on a popsicle stick. I ain't seen you in a long ass time. You know, it's funny, um, and this happens to me quite a bit when I see the, the boys that I hadn't seen for a while. I forget just how big everyone is from the Attitude Era compared to me. Um, cause now on the show, everybody's kind of the same size, but as soon as I saw you, it's been, gosh, I don't know, five, six years. And it's like, oh my God, like Austin's huge. I mean, you look great, but you're tall. Like even with the Hardys, I saw Matt and Jeff the first time in a few years. I couldn't believe how tall they were, but, um, yeah, man, it's great to see you. And, uh, I never knew that I hadn't done your show. I thought I'd done it before. No, dude, I actually, there was a little bit of a beef because this is between you and me, nobody knows. Well, you didn't even know. <laughs> I called you or sent you te- some text messages because I know you're going to be in, or you, you told me you're going to be in LA, mm-hmm. but you're filming one of your rock videos for Fozzie. Mm-hmm. I was like, Hey man, I'll come by the set if you don't mind. And we can knock out a podcast and you blew me off or you had other things to do. I can't remember Not that intentionally. I'm I would saying. never blow you off, yeah. but I'm just saying yeah. they didn't have nothing. Like, God dang, I was kind of perturbed. <laughs> Because I was like, I did his first two shows. Guy, guy's got it. You got to return the favor. You got me, pretty much got me hooked up with the gig. I mean, yeah. you were the one who was the contact that that t- took me there. So, like I said, I, I had thought for sure that I had done it. And when you said I still owe you one, I'm like, oh man, this is a debt that has to be repaid. I so. know it is. It's one of those things where I'm so bad about holding the grudge. It's like, God dang, Chris K paid me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I got here with this guy. But see, I don't even remember that that I could. I would have loved to have you come to the set. I'm not sure what happened. It, maybe we were busy filming or something. Dude, but. you know how the, the boys get. I mean, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. You know, halftime. It's, it's interesting. I don't know how you are with this. And uh, to, to everybody out there listening, we'll probably talk about wrestling in a minute. Mm-hmm. But it's always we'll funny, there. dude, when uh, when you get around the boys, sometimes you just want to catch up and just talk about mm-hmm. shit. And Chris is over at the house for about 30 minutes. We was drinking coffee, talking about labs. I can't believe you got a silver lab and a black lab just like I got. I walked through uh, your door, the gate that you have, and I saw the front door. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I saw a silver lab and a black lab, and I saw your wife. And I was like, is that a silver? Oh, yeah. We just got them. Uh, two months ago at the same time. So it blew me away. It's the exact same pairing, except for my black lab is a, a boy and yours is a girl. So we got that going for us. But, you know, it's like uh, I'd ask you a couple of times and you're busy or, or whatever life happens. And vice versa. And, you yeah. know, so, uh, but then it's also kind of like, you know, you do really well at s- spreading yourself around and you're traveling a lot more mm-hmm. than I am. Mm-hmm. So, so, and you've got your rock and roll connections, you've got your wrestling connections, you've got those out there connections. Me, I, man, I really like talking to the boys. You know, I just spend a lot of time talking to these, some of these cats. I don't think every A-lister in uh, LA is going to come over here to 317 Gimme Street and shoot the breeze with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, nor do I really want to shoot the breeze with them. Mm. So, but sometimes it's like, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, it's cool to ask somebody if you want to be on a show, but when you keep asking when they're a good guest or you enjoy talking to them, you almost like I feel like I'm imposing my friendship on them or it's like, eh, you know, that, that hold up that crucifix because Dracula's there. Right. Well, it's one of those Are things. you like that or he's like, Absolutely. hey, man, anybody want to do it? I was just talking this morning um, uh, to some people and I was telling them I've become that guy that because I'm so podcast uh, centric, I could meet. Like, for example, I did a show for TBS called Drop the Mic. It's like a a, a battle rap show. And the host is Method Man from Wu-Tang Clan. And he's a, a, hey, Jericho, what a guy. I'm a big fan. So automatically, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, well, you should do my podcast. In three seconds of meeting this guy. And I think a lot of people would be very honored by that. And other people would be like, you just said, like, calm down, dude. Like, I just met you. (laughs) It's like meeting a girl for the first time going, let's go make out. Like, I like to kiss. So I think, and I don't. I just get excited at the concept of talking to these different people that when am I ever going to see method man again, right. you know? And it turned out that a week later we had a show in, uh, uh, in long Island. I went to Staten Island. I did the show at his house. We had a blast. It was a great conversation, but I always think in that way. And I'm sure it does turn some people off and it has, but it's, you know, I think for the most part, people enjoy talking to someone that they either respect. There's mutual respect. Obviously, Steve Austin asks, you know, somebody from this generation to be on the show. They're going to bend over backwards to do it because it's Stone Cold Steve Austin. So I think it's 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 um, it's it's an honor for, for some people to do it and maybe a little bit of a, 
of a hardship, but if they really like you, they'll do it. Yeah, well, it is a funny thing because every time WWE, or most of the times when WWE comes through town, you know, some of the guys or girls will give me a heads up they're coming through. Mm-hmm. And I knew Bailey was in town one time. She was working with her CrossFit coach. And I said, hey, man, you want to go over and do a show? And mm-hmm. she did because I really like her. I like mm-hmm. Sasha. Mm-hmm. And they were coming back through town. I said, hey, you want to come by and do the show? And, and so they, they did, and she had to go do a meet and greet. And so then I hung out with Sasha, and we did a show. And I got to talk with Bailey for about 30 minutes, kind of a uh, three-people conversation. Yeah. But it was like, you know, she said, hey, man, it was good good seeing you. And then she said, maybe, like, next time we can just hang out. And I was like, oh, yeah. I said, man, that'd be great. We'll just drink a beer or, or whatever and just shoot the breeze. Because, you know, things change when you hit the record button, Chris. Yeah. You can get some honest, yeah. come-to-Jesus interviews. Mm-hmm. But when you hit the off button, just like some of the stuff we talked about over my house. Some stuff you don't want everybody to yeah, know. You don't want everybody but, to know. But one of the things I liked the little podcast at first is it gave me a chance to, uh, gave me an excuse, for example, to get together with my friends. This perfect example right, right now to do a podcast, but at work too. Like, you know, I remember the first time I had triple H on, you know, I'd never talked to triple H for an hour and a half before. Never had the chance. Usually he's doing one thing. I'm doing another thing. Maybe you're putting together a match. But to actually sit down and talk for an hour and a half, it was a lot of fun. And I like that about the people that I know in bands, behind this, uh, backstage wrestling. But even, like, we all grew up, for example, uh, uh, f- fans of the Fonz, Henry Winkler. I got invited to do a Comic-Con, and I don't do them a lot, but I, was like, I always said, who else is on the show? If there's somebody else on the show that I want to interview, and you can get me an interview with that guy, I'll come do the Comic-Con. And Henry Winkler was on. I said, I want Henry Winkler, and the guy was able to work it out. I got a chance to sit down with Henry Winkler for 45 minutes, like my childhood hero and Paul Stanley too. Those two guys were yeah. like right up there for me and Hulk Hogan. And to get sit down with these guys and actually talk to them one-on-one undivided attention. Nobody's coming into, you know, oh, we got to do this, 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 that to me is the best part of podcasting. I would almost do it for free for those reasons. Yeah. And, and that's cool when you, when you mention people like that, but, but you know, when uh, people from our business, it's like, if they're currently in the system and employed, well, you're kind of a free agent. Mm-hmm. Uh, but someone that's, you know, yeah, so they're yeah, <laughs> they're in the trenches. Yeah. Well, if you ask Big Show, because I talked to him on the podcast on the mm-hmm. Stone Cold podcast, he'll straight up tell you, "I ain't being buck worth a shit," yeah. you know, and get away with it. <laughs> he don't care. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but you just can't do that. But you everybody. can't say that if you're, you know, Bailey, for example. I mean, you you got to watch what you say because they're watching you. You know what I mean? At all times, even if you don't think they are. Well, they're listening. They're, they're watching. Yeah, they'll they'll listening, find whatever. out. You know, the, the yeah. boss will find out. And I often wonder, it's not even wonder, I'm sure it happens where he probably gets a report every day. Here's the social media report. Here's the Twitter report. Here's the podcast report. This person said this or that What's person said that. I don't know, but I would think, like, you know, whenever we were in Madison Square Garden back in the day <laughs> doing house shows and Vince <laughs> would always go to the garden and sometimes he wouldn't be there. Yeah. I'm sure he was always there. I'm sure there was times he was hiding up in the rafters like the Phantom of the Opera watching the show to see how the guys worked when they didn't think he was there. That's you know an what I mean? interesting concept. And I even said that to him once. I said the same thing. He used the Phantom of the Opera. And, of course, he gave me the Vince laugh and kind of just didn't yeah. answer and walked away. What's the Vince laugh? <laughs> Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> And that's it. Yeah. There's no answer either way. I'm like, okay. Um, and it's like that. I, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm sure they have people who are watchdogs. Because you get some of these guys that go on and they, they talk really bad shit on Twitter, which is the worst place you can do it, thinking that no one in the company is going to read it and go, you know what? If that's the way you feel, then go away. Right. Let's see what happens to you, buddy. You know? It was interesting when uh, I'd been trying to get Gallows and Anderson to be on the podcast. Mm-hmm. And the time they were set a couple of months ago, man, uh, Gallows got stranded and just because they, tr- they live in different locations. Yeah. And so he got stranded and it blew the podcast off. And I'd been really wanting them on the show. Finally, they made it. And I said, man, I said, uh, you know, if you guys want to sit down, have a couple of beers or whatever, you know, and I'll, I'll have some of my beer. But uh, what do you guys drink? Because you might not like my beer. And I said, well, you know, Bud Light. So I had a case of Bud Light. I had a case of uh, Miller Light, you know, on backup as another flavor. Some Broken Skull <laughs> IPA. Rocky Romero was here with Gallows Anderson. And yeah. I, I'd never heard any of you guys' podcasts, oh. but I heard they were like a riot. And I guess you guys, I don't know, it was it them that invented the term. Or, well, it's been around forever. Talking talk shop. shop. Yeah. So anyway, you know, I was like, you start off with some ABC shit, but I knew it was just going to be a laugh fest. So, man, those guys were absolutely awesome. And so... That, that was the case where on my Unleashed show, which is unfiltered, uncensored, anything goes, it's like, 
okay, it's cool for me to be as profane or whatever as I want to be, but I don't know that because you guys are in the PG system, what your language parameters are. Of course, right. one thing after another, dude, this whole table, I took a picture on my Twitter account. It was a case and a half of beer, <laughs> broke a skull IPA. Rocky Romero was drinking my beer with me. And, and those guys were just drinking, you know, reading novels like it was water. <laughs> and it was Katie bar the door. And that was an awesome success. I said to both those guys, because I just met them when they came to WWE, I think in 2015 or 16, whatever it was. I said, you know, I thought for a long time that I was the biggest piece of shit I'd ever met in this business. And then I met you two guys. And now I know I'm not the biggest piece of shit in the business. But those two guys, we had so much fun because they go back to the days of like, you know, when we were talking about how it was for us, when everybody was super crazy and a lot of it was dangerous because there's a lot of drugs. These guys are not drugs, it's drinking, but they have so much fun. And that to me, it, it was so much fun to be around them and be on the road with them. It reignited my love for being on tour as well, meeting a couple of kindred spirits like those guys. And they told me that same story. Yeah. And it was like, it was like, you know, like someone passing a torch or like, yeah, totally, like yeah, right. was, Hey, God damn it. It's cool to see someone that's is out there as I was Completely. or am. You know, we would do talk and shop, which is there were, there was the worst podcast ever they were doing in Japan. They told me about it the first time I had them on backstage, uh, San Diego Coliseum. And I said, well, we should do a talk and shop you know, presented by talk is Jericho. Like, what do you guys do? What do you, he's like, we'll just pick a night when we're going to be somewhere together and we'll just start drinking and see what happens. Okay. We go to Honolulu. Uh, it was going to be me, Gallows and Anderson. We got there early. We we're going to go walk down the beach, check out some places. Seven hours later, we're still at the same damn beach bar. Uh, Johnny Ace has passed out because of us. We're still awake. Let's go do a podcast. Bring in AJ Styles, who's uncle Alan to those guys, AKA Malibu Al. Cause that's all he drinks is Malibu rum. And we had this freaking podcast that was the most ridiculous, like you're almost like what the hell is going on there's nothing going on no one's listening to anybody else everyone's interrupting everybody else the security's knocking on the door so we bring the microphone out talk to them it's this podcast did like a million downloads yeah. people loved it and then we so we did talk and shop australia talk and shop china talk and shop nuremberg germany and that one was the worst we were so drunk you can you can't even listen to it but Gallows plays this uh, character oh, called oh, Reptile. That guy's an idiot. Yeah. I mean, that's a compliment. He's yes. hilarious. You'll love this, though. So he plays this character called Reptile. Like, hey, my name is Reptile. I'm a luchador. I'm here to do some things. Because all they do is voices. Yeah. Sour Boy, uh, Hell Yeah Man, uh, you know, Mountain Man, like uh, Gordy Canuck. So uh, he's doing this Reptile. So uh, we always have a rotating fourth. And the rotating fourth at this point is Primo Cologne, uh, Carlos's son. So we call Carlos Colon in Puerto Rico and Eddie's like, Hey pops, I got this guy. Uh, his name is Reptile. He wants to get booked. And Carlos is like, who is he? Yeah, he's a pretty good kid. And he wants to... So Gallows gets on the phone with Carlos Colon, the legendary. Carlos. Yeah. Like, My name is Reptile. I like to do the talk and on the topics. I like to do the quote, the quote juice. And Carlos Colon's like, who is this guy? <laughs> so <laughs> Primo's like, you know, he talks to him for a bit. If I go, so what do you think, Pops? Is he booked? And Carl's like, sure, whatever. So we actually got Reptile booked in Puerto Rico <laughs> with Carlos Colon. But like you said, like these guys, they are a perfect example, like Dean Malenko, like Brad Armstrong, of these guys that are so funny backstage but haven't found a way to transfer that on screen yet. How do you figure that is? Because you just mentioned Dean Malenko is just one of the fastest guys on a verbal conversation, just popping you. So funny. Yeah. And Brad Armstrong could light up any dress room. Yeah. Supremely funny. Yeah. But And also highly respected as a worker in, in any style. Technicians, yeah. yeah. And Dean Malenko, man of a thousand holes. And, of course, you're a man of a thousand and one. one. <laughs> We're going to talk about <laughs> Although now I'm down to about 235 yeah, at this ridiculous. point in time. I forgot a lot. <laughs> okay. And you Just to answer your question quickly, you, before you said why is that. I think some guys, uh, like you mentioned, sorry to interrupt, but, but no, no. what you mentioned when the red light is on, uh, I think a lot of guys weren't comfortable playing uh, a character that wasn't like, like Dean was trained by his dad, very serious, very much exchanging holds, Carl Gotch, that sort of thing. I don't think he ever felt comfortable letting go and being funny Dean in the ring because I don't think he wasn't, he was not taught that way. Uh, and Brad, I think, was the same. Some guys just don't have. Like you said, when when you turn the recorder on, it's a different conversation when the recorder is off. But, I mean, they were still spectacular in the ring, though. But it, it almost kind of gives me uh, a parallel into another business or uh, living or passion that you're in, rock and roll mm -hmm. music. So, uh, you know, you see, let's, let's take, for instance, a a band that would be technically extremely good mm -hmm. but didn't have a run that 
they should have had. Okay, like Dream Theater comes mm-hmm. immediately to my mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, great band. Yeah. Great band. Wouldn't you agree? Should have had a bigger run. Well, here's one thing I've learned over the years, because, excuse me, I was a huge Dream Theater fan from about 94 to 2004, like one of my top three bands. Um, but then you grow older and you realize it's like the, 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 the best band of all time is ACDC. I've, I've learned that from being in a band and from watching bands. My wife is going to tell you Rush. <laughs> well, the thing is, Rush is great. DT, Dream Theater is great. But it's a style of music based around playing, based around, you know, it's like wrestling. It's like going to a Lucha Libre match. How many flips and flops and flies can you do until it just starts running together? Now, if you're into that sort of thing, Dream Theater is the best of the best. Right. It's incredible what they can do, and nobody can touch them. But there's something. Uh, why didn't they get a bigger run? Because it's a very limited uh, style of music. I can't play Dream Theater for my wife. She doesn't want to hear a 10 minute song. Yeah. She wants to hear a 30 minute you know, guitar solo. Whereas ACDC, three minute punch, doof, bah, doof, bah. It's, it's sex. It's like Steven Tyler used to say it's fing music. It's music you can get off to. Doof, right. bah, doof, bah. That appeals to everybody. Interesting. Yeah. I just think that when you're talking about, like, Rush was a little bit more accessible because they had a little bit more of a pop element. Dream Theater won't do that. Um, and, and that's why Dream Theater, they've had a huge run for, for who they are as a band. Had they done a couple more fly-by-night type songs, for example, you know, uh, closer to the heart maybe type of a thing that Rush did, they might have been a little bit bigger. But the time when they tried that, the fans revolted. They didn't want to hear Dream Theater do that. Whereas Rush had 40 years of having all these different styles so right. they could go play, you know, La Strangiata, uh, you know, 14-minute instrumental, and you go nuts, and then they play Closer to the Heart, and you go nuts as well, Tom Sawyer. That's Again, but, but because everything's so subjective, I think it's whatever the crowd is in unison or from uh, the biggest piece of the pie, mm-hmm. you know, what, what people are looking for. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, are you looking for technical excellence, or are you looking for or, or technical sound? Or are you looking for entertainment or someone just grabs you by the throat? And got, or, or uh, like, you know, like uh, for, for instance, in, in, in Stone Cold. Mm-hmm. Stunning Steve, eh, I didn't really grab too much. But Stone mm-hmm. Cold, I finally came up with the right gimmick, had enough talent, was a good enough mechanic, timing. But here's another band. Uh, and I don't know if you ever, uh, and we're going to shift off of music because I want to talk to you about uh, your letter match with uh, Shawn Michaels. And I want to talk about Alpha Omega and some other things. But were you ever into at all? Y and T from San Francisco. Never really, and I'll tell you the reason why. Because I know a lot of people like Eddie Trunk, our merch girl in mm-hmm. Europe. Well, actually, she's now Zach's personal assistant. She will be Y and T for life, and she's thirty years old. For me, when I got into real deep into music, Y and T was going through their glam phase yep. of summertime lipstick girls. and leather, summertime girls, contagious. So they just came across as like Bon Jovi light to me. Uh, I never got into the Mean Streak, Black Tiger, That's what late I got 70s, about. early, and I missed that. 87. It's the same thing. I missed UFO. I missed Scorpions with uh, Uli John Roth. And if you go to a Scorpion show, like I went with Scott Ian before, Kirk Hammett, those guys worship at the feet of 70s Scorpions. I'm like, I don't get it. I like 80s 80 80 Scorpions because that's when I came in. I'm with that. So I never got into the Y&T because of that because uh, I just thought they were kind of Bon Jovi light and never bothered to delve back further into their catalog. God dang, but Dave Minichetti with the vocal talent and a guitar talent, a double threat. Well, yeah, and, and, and still well respected to this day. I mean, he's the, the last remaining original member in the band. They still tour and they still you know do good business, especially in Europe. But it's just one of those bands that missed for me. I never got it. You know it. what I think about that? I was thinking, okay, it was a unique sound. It's not for everybody. It's not like, like, like you said, to your point, ACDC. When you hear ACDC, dude, I mean, if you have any metal in you at all, mm. it's, it's really hard not to like that. Mm. So if you have any rock and roll in you at all, you know, Y&T just might not float your boat. Well, you know, and but I think it was the gimmick. Y and T. Eh, it's hard for me to, you know, I got it on a Agreed. musical level yeah, Agreed. from the gimmick. I, I agree. And that's what we're talking about. You're, the gimmick of Y and T. Obviously, it was yesterday and today when they started. Change it to Y and T. Doesn't make sense. I don't know what, what it means. I, I see it. a picture of the band. And this is a made a big deal. You'll understand this. Uh, they weren't all that hot, for lack of a better term. There was nothing really sexy about Y and T. 
you know, because when you're growing up, like obviously I'm not attracted to Bon Jovi, but you look at the guy and go, man, this guy picks up chicks. I want to be like that guy, you know, or David Lee Roth. Like that guy, what a, that, man, he's kicking and he's sexy and he's funny. You never got that with the Y&T guys. Well, and you, you would just from uh, the music, I don't know what you lean toward, towards as far as their music goes, but along those lines, like when you look at ACDC, there's was four guys that weren't that good looking, but you didn't expect them to be good looking because they're playing this badass, kick ass rock and but roll. Same with Skinner. I mean, yeah, like maybe one good looking dude, but everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. else. I mean, and I don't yeah. mean this is a knock. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm just talking straight up. But it was God, a different damn, style. Skinner was a badass band. Absolutely, but different type of vibe. Once again, you're talking about a southern rock band. Uh, they're not. Like Y and T is in the gene pool competing with Bon Jovi, Motley Crue, you know, whoever else was hot at the time. Leonard Skinner's Southern Rock. They should look like they're from Florida, from the bayou. You know, A C D C had the biggest gimmick of all time, a- Angus Young. Yeah. And then throwing Brian Johnson with the hat, that's two gimmicks for the price of one. Right. So you could use there's something about them you can latch on to. Um, and I've found that over the years is that you always have, and especially a band like YNT, once again, it's hard to be a great front man when you have a guitar. Now, Paul Stanley is the best at it. James Hetfield's right behind him. But you got to be a huge personality to be a front man and play guitar at the same time. And that's another thing that hurts that band. Too. Okay, then. Okay. And duly noted, what about a front man without an instrument? Best front man? Yep. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you have to go with David Lee Roth. Uh, Freddie Mercury. Okay. Um, I'll throw Bruce Dickinson in there from Iron Maiden. Yep. Um, those are kind of the three that 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 that. You had to put Freddie Mercury me. in there because I was going to say absolutely. He's got to be either one or two. Uh, absolutely. You know, David Lee Roth. His rap wasn't that great, but he was just it was just, he fit the part. He, he had that vibe. Bill. And he all was, the stuff that he got from you know because he, he got his routine from. Who's the guy? That, there was a southern kind of a southern rock. Oh, it's Jim Dandy. Jim Dandy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And he kind of stole his gimmick, right? Yeah, yeah. He kind yeah, of the yeah. same vibe. But Roth was almost like a stoner. He was like Spicoli in Fast Times, in that his rap wasn't great, but just the way he delivered it, you know. Well, one of the things about that guy was that when he was doing interviews, he was so out there and mm-hmm. so you know, Jesus Christ. I mean, he's articulate. Uh, in his own way, but highly intelligent. He can ramble and he can mm-hmm. get out there. He's full of himself, but he, God dang, is he interesting? See, and yes. I, and that's one. Of, I know you didn't like the episode, but I loved your episode with Roth because he was just being Roth. And I know that you were trying to ask him certain questions, but like I enjoyed it because I hear I got Steve Austin talking to Dave Lee Roth, two very iconic characters in their different worlds colliding. I thought it was great. But you know what? As you know from doing all your podcasts, as long as you've been doing it, over 400 episodes, mm-hmm. it's so much better when you're talking to someone in person. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So oh, was that on the phone with him? Person. Yeah. Oh, well, Dude, that was, and, and this was way back in the day when this was in a glass studio where you could see everybody. Like, if this room was glass, you could see everybody else working in a different right, cubicle. Right, right. There's no atmosphere. There's no vibe. He, I think he's in New York City at the time. I'm in L. LA. It's hard. I got all these notes. I mean, I, I didn't even know my producer. I was green. It was one of those type yeah. of things. It's hard to do a podcast over the phone. As a front man, I, I got to throw, I'm not, as an all time great, no, but someone that I, that I have to put in there is Ian Asbury. Oh, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. You know, I mean, the, the cult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, did you ever get into them? I loved the cult. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite albums of all time is Cult Electric. It came out in 1987. And it was like at the right time of year. It was like, it was like, I think it came out in May. And that whole summer, we just spent it at the beach. That was kind of the soundtrack to the summer. I never saw the Cult as being a great live band, though. The times I saw them, Asper, it was cool, but he, 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 was, he wanted to be more Jim Morrison. He wanted to be mysterious, you know? Great singer, yep. great list of tunes. But as a band, they never grabbed me as very, being super exciting. And I, I get that. But for, for me, from not being a concert guy, I think I've been to, I don't know, 10 concerts in my entire no life. Oh, dude, my first concert was Axe in Heaven, probably before <laughs> your time. And they were opening for Motley Crue. Wow. And I know we're going to do a podcast together. We're going to talk about music. Right. But my, when I was uh, growing up, my dad was in a, a country and western band. He played lead guitar mm-hmm. and he sang. So, dude, I, I, I couldn't sing even mm-hmm. then. So I was going to be a you know lead guitarist, mm-hmm. you know, but I didn't apply myself. And he's my stepdad technically, so yeah. I didn't get his musical genetics. Right, right, right. Tried to bass, no, they weren't buying me a drum kit, you know, so that didn't happen. <laughs> but anyway, I, I was really into the to, the to the rock and roll stuff and old country. My brother Kevin, who's ten months younger than me, when this is when Motley Crue first came out with "Shout at the Devil," and he goes, "Hey man, check this out," and I was like, I went into the crew because I I never heard of him, but this is before I went to the concert, obviously. 
And I looked at the cover. I said, man, pretty good looking chicks in a manly kind of way. <laughs> I didn't know that there was guys. I remember looking at Vince Neil on that cover and going, how can that chick be so flat chested? And how can they let her be on the front cover with no shirt on? Cause he looked like the hottest yeah. chick, but he's his, his chest is hanging up, but there's no boobs, yeah. you know? I mean, Molly crew be going to be, you know, one of my favorite bands of all time. Yeah. I can put them up there and you know, they had a great run. Right. The Steve Austin show, the Steve Austin show. Paying out of your own pocket for gear you need to do your job is a problem. All kinds of departments across the nation, police, fire, EMS, medical workers on the front lines, and even military units, they all deal with constrained budgets and outdated gear. But there's still a job to do, and you need the gear to do it. Hunting for military first responder discounts has historically required going from one website to another and all kinds of hassle. Don't you wish there was one place you could visit that had a carefully crafted selection of deals for military first responders in one spot? GovX works directly with brands to negotiate the best prices possible because you deserve the gear you need at the prices you've earned. Plus, you can trust that the gear you're ordering is 100% authentic, direct from the manufacturer. If you must pay out of your own pocket, you shouldn't have to pay a premium to get the gear you need to effectively perform your duties and complete your mission. GovX has a huge collection of gear and apparel from popular brands, all in one convenient location. It's like a grown man's toy store in here. Just wait until you see our knife collection. All you need to do is sign up for free. No subscription fees. No re-upping your membership every year. Once you're approved, you're a fully-fledged GovX member for life. GovX honors your service and gives back to your communities. We don't just thank you for your service. We honor it. So if you're an American of service, a current or former member of the military, firefighting, frontline medical, or law enforcement communities, or the emergency medical, join GovX for free and enjoy a community that honors and gives back to patriots like you. If you've got a military or first responder background, visit GovX.com and sign up for free for instant access to tons of deals and a community that honors your service. Visit GovX.com and receive $15 off first orders over $50 or more when you use code Steve. That's $15 off first orders over $50 or more when you use code Steve at GovX.com. Let's shift gears and make a segue into uh, a little bit of wrestling. You just come off a high-profile match with Kenny Omega. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. I watched it. Oh, Outstanding thanks, match. But by the same token, I had to get back and watch uh, some of your stuff from WWE. Now, here's the deal. Uh, you've been doing a podcast forever. I've been doing it for a little bit over than forever, 500 episodes. Man, I didn't want to jump on Wikipedia and research your ass. Mm-hmm. I don't know how long we've known each other, man. Mm-hmm. 20 years. When did you roll into WWE? Was it 98 Nin- or 99? 99. I mean, and okay. I met you a couple times before that on the plane one time, and you gave me the all-time greatest uh, line of all time. What was that, Dick? <laughs> you know, you said, oh, no, it was a great line. I was, I was walking on the plane. It was one of those rare moments when you would see WWE and WWE, uh, WCW on the same plane. And, uh, and you walked by me, and you said, hey. And I didn't even, I just knew Steve Austin. I'm like, hey, he's like, hey. He goes, you know, there's, there's a gay guy on the plane. I said, really? He goes, yeah. Give me a kiss, and I'll tell you, which, I'll tell you who it is. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, you said, who is it? I said, kiss me, I'll tell you. That's right, yeah. That's right, yeah. <laughs> you can't blow the punchline yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, no pun intended. That's, see, that was your line. I just, yeah. I just remember, like, Steve Austin just told me a joke. And then I saw you again at Brian Pillman's memorial show in Norwood, Ohio. Yeah. Uh, I was working with Benoit, and you were there to give your support as well. So that was about 98. So that's technically when I when I met you. It was God that time dang. Frame. Man, I remember seeing you coming up uh, when you first showed up in WCW. I said, man, he's a good-looking kid, long tights, his long hair pulled back in a little gimmick and ponytail or whatever you call it. I was like, man, this motherfucker, talented. I can see you coming. You can feel the mm-hmm. charisma coming through the TV screen. I was like, man, this kid's pretty good. Mm. And then you came to New York, and I guess when you made your debut, uh, when you interrupted The Rock's promo, shit, was I even in a building, or had mm-hmm. I taken my ball and went home at that point? No, you were there. Okay. You were there. Dude, that was, that was an, that was an, uh, an awesome debut 
Whose idea was the whole Y2J thing? Was um, it in collaboration with anybody? No. Are, are you going to Gene Simmons me on this? If everything was you. How did, how did it go down, brother? I invented uh, air, Steve. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> what happened was, um, I, it was at the time, because people ask me now, kids ask me, what does Y2J mean? I'm going to go ask your parents. So at the time frame, 1999, uh, you know, as, as everyone who's our age knows, there was supposed to be a giant computer bug called the Y2K virus that was going to shut down the entire infrastructure, computers, the whole, you know, don't fly a plane because it's going to f- drop out of the sky. I remember I had $5,000 cash uh, and a box of, I had this protein drinks at the time with Tang and I was going to live off the $5,000 cash and I had my, you know, liquid meals with me so I could survive when the, when the riot happened and nothing happened. Right. So, but still it was, everything was Y2K, Y2K, Y2K. And I just thought Y2J, I'm going to the WWE, obviously Jericho for J. Yep. Um, I thought that's a great name for my finish. I'll call it the Y2J or, or the Y2J problem or whatever it may be. And I was at the mail the mail, the mail house, the post office. Um, I used to have a self-addressed stamp envelope to sign pictures. To I wasn't doing f- all on WCW, so I was at least trying to start a rapport with the fans. Early days of the internet. Send me your self-addressed. I'll send you the thing back. So I was waiting in line at the post office, and it said like, you know, 122 days, seven hours, four minutes, and three seconds until the new millennium. I thought, wow, counting down. What a cool idea. Count down to the new millennium. That would be a cool way for someone to come into the WB. Wait, that'd be a cool way for me to come into the WB. So I came up with the idea of the Millennium Man with the countdown. Um, Vince's contributions to it were that the countdown, my idea was it would end at the beginning of Raw, on, I think it was August 9th, 1999. Vince's idea was it would end right in the middle of The Rock's promo, which classic Vince, you know, come in as high as you can possibly yeah. get. And his other idea was, he's like, well, what's your finish called? And what is it? And I said, well, it's, you know, it's a Boston crab and it's called Y2J problem. And he's going, no, 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 that's not the name of your finish. He goes, your finish isn't Y2J, your Y2J. And that was his, you know, moniker. And for the first year or two, I'm sure you got this too. It was never Chris or Chris Jericho was always Y2J. How are you Y2J? Good to see you Y2J. Cause that was his creation. Even though it was my idea, he took it, and that's what he right. called me. I'm sure it's the same with Stone Cold. I'm sure he called you Stone Cold all the time. I remember we always had to reference you as Stone Cold Steve Austin. I could say it four or five times, but because Stone Cold Steve Austin, let me tell you, I'm going to come down the ring, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and I'm going to beat you up, Stone Cold, because that's the name, right? Not Steve, not Austin, right. Stone Cold Steve Austin. And Steve almost humanizes me, and we didn't want to humanize you. You, you are now a brand, right? Stone Cold Steve Austin, Y2J. And that's kind of where it all started, you know, and, and I think you'll appreciate this. And I'm, I'm sure I've ever told you this before, but when I came into the company, I was a really popular baby face. Eventually it started as a heel turn baby face. Um, if you look at all the beach towels and Seven Eleven cups at the time, there's always three guys on it. You, me, uh, and rock. And I started realizing that like, I'm the George Harrison of the attitude era. I'm super popular, I'm super over, but I'm in a band with the two most popular over characters possibly ever. It doesn't matter what George does, he's never going to top <laughs> Lennon and McCartney, right? Yeah. No matter what I do as a babyface, I'll never top Rock and Austin, so what can I do? I'll turn heel. And that's where that whole started, uh, pitching to turn heel on you and on Rock to start working with you guys, because I knew I could never get past you guys or higher than you guys. You guys need someone to work with that can hold the microphone and go toe-to-toe with you. Because it wasn't easy to go toe-to-toe with you. It wasn't right. easy to go toe-to-toe with Rock. You guys were so good and had the crowd in the palm of your hand. You needed a good heel to be able to work with. Oh, absolutely. That could talk yeah, and could, heel. could go, but could go on the mic with you as well. Yeah. And that's kind of where I think we had some really good times with that. Out of all your, your times in the business, Jesus Christ, how long have you been in the ring now? 27 years. 27 yeah. years. October 9th. Oh, sorry, October 2nd, 1990 was my debut. Yeah. Heal a baby. Um, to give you the wishy-washy answer, honestly, heal. I love, I've been a world champ six times, all of them as a heel. Never won it as a baby face. Um, I think a lot of that's because of the George Harrison thing. But to me, is I think it's a very rare character in the business that can portray a heel and a baby face at the same level. You know, you look at like flair when flair was, he could never really play a baby face as good as he could as a heel. Same, same with Hulk. I'm Hogan. 
he was okay heel, but as a baby face, it's Hulk. So, oh, right? Well, what? So to do both is a very hard skill. And I take great pride in the fact that I can do both. I prefer heel, but I always say it's a lot easier to make somebody hate you than it is to make them like you. But once they start hating you, it's hard to keep them hating you. It's like the greatest heels of all time in movies. Darth Vader, Terminator, uh, Hannibal Lecter, the Joker, all of those characters, Freddy Krueger, as the movies went on, they became the baby faces. I used to go Nightmare on Elm Street just to watch Freddy Krueger kill the kids. He wasn't right. scary anymore. He was cool. Yeah. That's what happens. Terminator 2, Arnold's the baby face at this point because he's so good as a heel, you start liking him. That's the true key of wrestling. If you can be a heel and stay a heel, it's very hard to do. What was your relationship like with Vince when you first came into the company? Y'all started talking about the Y2J thing and uh, how that morphed into your communication process with him. Because I'd been in with Vince several times, and I've told this story many times. I apologize to my listeners for making me tell it again or making you listen to it again. Sitting in a Jeep, one time was going to do a gig, throw a belt off a bridge or do something, one of those shenanigans. At the time, uh, Vince drove a Jeep Grand Cherokee. I'm riding shotgun. He's driving. We're at a gate. It's locked with a chain. No one's there to unlock the chain so we can go do the gig. And so we're just sitting there with a thumbs up our ass. It's weird. You know, because we don't know each other, man. <laughs> you know, I, I just turned from the ringmaster from the Stone Cold. Right. And I'm starting to get a little momentum. And he's personally, and we're in his car to do this gig. Just out of the blue. He looks over at me. Dude, out of the blue. And he says, you know, Steve, as a promoter, you never want a talent to know what they're worth. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, I was like, I'm like what do you say? Mm -hmm. I just, I didn't say nothing. I just sat there like, it. man, that was weird. Mm -hmm. He's a third generation promoter, one of the smartest guys mm -hmm. walking planet Earth. <laughs> About two minutes later, he fires up the Jeep, runs through the gate. We go do the gig. Just, <laughs> just blast it straight up, shoot, blast the chain off. And so, like, man, that that right there forever opened my eyes and and my brain to okay, here's what's up. Yeah. And then one time we're in the garden again, and you know, from working MSG. We're about to go do uh, Monday Night Raw, and they're at the Barclays Center and the Manhattan Center. I don't know where I'm going to be. What, whatever's going to happen, it happens. But an MSG, that's a short entrance. And there's that blue curtain. And like you said, when Vince is there, he's watched that curtain, or maybe he's prowling around at the top. <laughs> you, we don't know he's there. One time, we was watching those matches go down, watching everybody go to the ring. I was probably working the main. And uh, sold out house. Steve Blackman goes to the ring, gets a hell of a pop, pretty good pop. You know, and he was it was on his way. You know, Steve Steve Blackman had really good worker, mm -hmm. uh, really good physique, believable, believable, just solid. Mm -hmm. And but he's never hit that that next level. And boy, he got a pretty good pop. And I looked over at Vince and said, "Damn, pretty good pop." And Vince goes, "Yep, I really hope he can get over." Mm. And I'm like, "There it is again." You know, Vince doesn't just wave a little wand over there, hit you with that pixie dust, that magic dust. And all of a sudden, somebody's over. So. How was your – meaning well, you, you, Vince don't just come at somebody. Or just take Roman Reigns, for instance. I mean, they're like, just point at a guy and say, you're over. Mm -hmm. It does not happen like that. So going back to – man, I don't go back in history. Just Let's start off with the old man, then I want to peel it back a little bit to go through WCW and your territory days. Because one of the things I've always respected about you, I caught you in ECW. I didn't see you when you was in Mexico or when you was up in Canada or all those other places. Mm -hmm. You got over in ECW. You got over in WCW. You got over mm -hmm. in WWF. Mm -hmm. You got over everywhere you went. Well, that's, and I'll answer your question about Vince, but that's one of the reasons why I was able to get over in, in WWE because I'm not sure if you went through it. I think you did. Obviously, you did with the ringmaster. When we came from this other territory, other company, it doesn't matter what you've done anywhere else in the world until you go through the WWE curtain and Vince can see you. He doesn't care if you're Steve Austin, Triple H, Mick Foley, Chris Benoit, AJ Styles, or Chris Jericho. I would say he probably doesn't watch any wrestling whatsoever. He might hear some names. I don't think he cares. Your job when you get to the WWE is to basically start from scratch and show Vince what you can do. And if you can get over with him, you'll get a chance to get over. Not the pixie dust, but you need to get over with Vince first to get the chance to really get over, if that makes sense. Um, so with Vince, actually a wise man, a, a bald guy with a goatee who's sitting across from right now, you, you said to me, you know, you really have to establish a relationship with Vince. It's so important. You told me that. And I've told a lot of guys that now. You have to get over this. Vince is very intimidating. And he's very 
scary, like waiting outside his office. You feel like you have to wait to go into the principal. Even to this day, I'm nervous to go in his office. But you have to establish that relationship with him so you can break that wall down of Vince McMahon, the boss, and Chris Jericho, the employee, and then two guys who are working together to create a good product. And then if you're really lucky, like Vince, I consider him to be a friend of mine now. Uh, I asked him to go to ACDC with me last year when they were at the Garden with Axl Rose, and then he ended up tearing his quad and he, and you know, he never said he would go, but I invited him. And I'm like, what if he wants to go? Like, what am I going to do? Like, do I, do I stand in the seats with Vince and like air guitar with them? Like, what are we going to do if he shows up? Like, do, are these seats going to be good enough for him? Do I have to get a box now? Like, what do I do? Like, how is he as a guy? But there's a couple times over the years. Um, and it took me a long time to really get to that relationship. I would say that it took me till 2008, eight years of working for Vince until I lived up to the potential that I think he saw in me, but I never really delivered it to that level. Then I created that kind of uh, the hypocrite suit and tie, very slow talking character, worked with Sean. We had this amazing chemistry. Obviously, Sean, as you know, the best baby face a heel could ever work with. Yeah. And we were perfect match. Great baby face, great heel, great chemistry in the ring and out. And we had this whole big, long seven-month angle. And that's when I think Vince saw me as a legit top guy that you can put the put the, the rocket to. Um, and I was world champion four times during that run. And ever since then, we became closer and closer was from that. What did you learn? Uh, I, was, I was watching, uh, God dang, is it Bruce Hart? Mm -hmm. Bruce, Bruce still with us? Yeah, Bruce is still alive, okay, yeah. Bruce, uh, it might have been a Bruce interview talking to uh, the dude from uh, Northwest Wrestling, Hannibal. Now, you started over, right? How long were you in that Calgary area? A long time, man. Like, um, I trained there with the Hart brothers, even though there was no Hart brothers at camp. Thank right. God Lance Storm was there. Cause first, and you all met from day one. From day one. It's like planes, trains, and automobiles when John Candy, when the train breaks down, he's got that big giant trunk, and he's trying to carry it across the plane, yeah. and then Steve picks up the one side. That's exactly what happened. I had this big trunk, and we were living in a hotel called the Willie, the Willingdon in Okotoks, Alberta, which is about 30 minutes outside of Calgary. And I had to climb the stairs to get to my room, and I had this big trunk with all my worldly possessions, and Lance... Hey, are you here for a wrestling school? Yeah, yeah. My name's last name's Chris. You need a hand? Sure. Picked up the one side of my trunk, and that's how I got it upstairs. So, day one, first day I showed up was was him with him. So, how long were you there? I lived in Calgary till about ninety four. So I was working on and off, but also I had a. I've been working full time since ninety two. Okay. Mexico was full time. Then it was uh, Japan got full time. Smoky Mountain, but I still lived in and Calgary until ninety four. Some time in Germany as well, right? I did. I went there in ninety three for six. Okay. Weeks, my question yeah. to you is: as you're making those rounds, and and then I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, communication process in Mexico because I'm not imagining you speak Spanish. I learned. Okay. Yeah. Smart guy. Yeah. What about your early years? Taught you. How to get over? Where well, did you? I mean, because dude, you're you're 27 years in now. Yeah. When I talk about getting over, I always like to talk about it with people who got over, because I still think it's a lost art. Yeah, and I, I, I don't. I always like to hear how anybody else vocalizes or intellectualizes sure. it. To, to finish up the point that we were making before is that I got over in WWE. It was very hard when I first came in because there was a lot of. Uh, there was a, there was a target on my back because there was still the wrestling war was real. Dude, WCW and WWE. Dude, that was a fierce dressing room. It was. And it when was. you came in, I mean, I, I don't know how you felt, but I mean, I, I saw yeah, I saw talent. I said, man, this dude's got you know he can talk and he can work. I said, you know, I'm on my game. Yeah, yeah, but I also came in um, as a WCW guy, you know, WCW. Um, by myself. I didn't come in with Dean and, and Eddie and, and Chris and those guys. I didn't come in. Big Show came in by himself as well, but he's a giant. It's hard to, Different. you know, I'm, you know, five foot 11, 220 pounds and long blonde hair. There's other guys in the company that have long blonde hair that probably didn't like that aspect of it. And also too, I came in with not a bad attitude, but I came in with some attitude. I wasn't afraid to. Was it an attitude or a chip on your shoulder? Uh, at the, it turned into a big chip. At the time, I just came in as a heel. So I had no problem. I didn't know that you weren't supposed to talk shit about The Undertaker in a promo or talk bad about Steve Austin in a promo. <laughs> that's what heels do to baby faces, right? But I learned very quickly that's not what heels do when they first come in. I had no idea. Nobody ever taught me anything about that in WCW. They didn't even tell me how to bump and feed a comeback. I worked WCW for three years and had no idea what that even meant, as crazy as it sounds right now. Long story short, I eventually got over because I'd been over everywhere I'd ever been to for one reason and one reason only. Uh, I, could, I knew how to connect with the fans. If you can connect with an audience, whether you make them love you or hate you, 
You'll always have a job and you'll sell tickets and you'll become valuable. Uh, if you can connect with the audience, um, they'll be excited to see what you do. And the other thing I did in WWE was I knew, okay, I can't, I can't win with like, you know, Hunter and DX and, you know, Rocky was always cool and you were in and out and you were, you know, you were onto your own, but you were always cool to me. But what I did was I worked really hard always, but I knew if I could get over with the bullpen, with the mid-level guys, that that would bleed up to the top. Bob Hawley, um, you know, those type of guys, uh, JBL, Bradshaw at the time, you know, working with those type of Rikishi, having great matches night after night with those guys, which is where I was programmed. The word gets around, you know, this guy is not an asshole. You guys are talking shit about him, but he's really good and he's a good guy. That kind of helped to uh, alleviate some of the tension that was there. Um, so that's basically how I got over. I believed in myself and I connected uh, with the audience. And how do you, esta- how do you establish or, or communicate to an individual, one of the boys or gals listening? How do you connect with the people? I don't know. I, I, it's, that's all. It's almost like saying like, how do you sing like Paul Stanley or how do you, how do you get over like Steve Austin? How do you throw a football? Like, you know, I don't even know really anything about Brett Favre or whoever's a good quarterback. Um, I don't really know. I think it's something that you have inside of you. It's that charisma, fearlessness. You can't be afraid to, oh, something you can relate to. You can't be afraid to be Stone Cold Steve Austin and put on a little cowboy hat and sing Kumbaya on a freaking ukulele out of tune and horrible. Like that was you committing to the character. I committed to the character every time as a heel, as a baby face, anything I could do to, 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 you know, never, ever again, for example, start in WCW when I ripped Dave Penzer's tuxedo off. And the next week they made me go back in there with a tuxedo. And I said, I promise I will never, ever like just over the top. Like I got it from Sally field. You like me, you really like me. And it's like, I don't like you anymore from that. So I'll never, ever do it again. And then you see people with signs and Jimmy Hart taught me. He said, Jimmy was great, man. I love, love, love Jimmy Hart. But he told me, he said, you can't make people write signs. I mean, you know, you can plant them, but these weren't planted. You can't, you. you can't force somebody to write Austin 316 or never, ever again with 14 uh, pieces of cardboard with one E, one E, one E, one V. You can't, this is buddy's, hey, dude, let's take a ever sign. And that's how you know you're starting to connect. That's like the ultimate compliment. It is. And so you you're have to connecting. be connecting. Exactly. You have to be fearless, just like you with, with Austin 360. You took a chance. It might have stuck. It might not have. If that not have stuck, some, stuck something else would have. Um, and I always laugh because I have so many kind of, let's say, hits for catchphrases. If I was in a rock and roll, well, I am, but you know, like a hit with Ayatollah of rock and roll, a hit with Roz Jericho. But there's been some misses. I remember that I thought Razzle Dazzle. That's going to be huge. That'll be the next catchphrase. I'm going to get a little razzle dazzle, yeah. razzle dazzle, and then just die to death. And the other one was uh, was uh, get it, got it, good. And I would say get it, and the crowd would say got it, and then I would say good. It just I tried it a couple of times. It sucked. It stunk. Um, you had one. Do you remember? What, I'll tell you one that you had. What? Which one was it? I'm going to put a little stink on it. What? I'm going to put a little stink on it. Oh, you know. <laughs> you went through the phase. That would be your thing you would say every time. Before what? I'm going to put a little stink on it. And then yeah. I'm going to put a little stink on it. And just kind of like. <laughs> Man, when you, when, you, when you throw out a turd. It, it, <laughs> it humbles you. It's just sinking feelings like, God damn, I, I can't let them see me. I'm not going to let them see me sweat. But inside, I know this shit ain't working. But you got to try. But you got to try. And that's the thing. Like, you got to be fearless. Um, the, the old saying is like, uh, the only failure is not trying, but a lot of people uh, in the business are afraid to try. And also at this point in time, aren't given the option to try. And that to me, like when I thought of the idea of the highlight reel, my initial idea was learning from one of the greatest, uh, I don't even know what you would call him backstage interviews is Gene Okerlund right. who could lead you through a backstage promo, even if you didn't know what you were doing. Right. Yeah. That's how I learned how to do promos. I used to go sit in the box. WCW had a box where you would do localized promos. We're coming to Jacksonville. We're coming to, you know, the, the Odessa, whatever. And I would just sit in there because you're, sit, you're sitting around all day. There's nothing to do. I'll go watch guys do promos. And I watch Arn Anderson and Ric Flair and, you know, the, the Mountie or Glacier, whoever's there getting promos. And then maybe one day they'll ask me. And one day Luger didn't show up because he wanted to go to the gym. So we well, what about that guy? He's always sitting in the corner. He want to do a promo? Sure. And I remember it was for uh, 
Where's the Van uh, the Van Andel Arena? I think it's Kalamazoo. No, Wings Wings calls him. No, it's Grand Rapids or something. One of those Michigan cities. And I had to do a promo. It's rotten. But Gene Oakland was the guy who was doing the interview and led me through it. And then the next week they gave me two, and then they gave me three, and four. That's how I learned how to promo. No script, just on your own instincts. And my idea when I started the Hyler was I wanted to be the Gene Oakland, have guys come out that didn't get promo time and let me do an improv promo. Let's see what they got. That, of course, did not fly with Vince. He wanted it to be an actual promo segment with top-level guys. And But my idea was I wanted to see what can people do when they're not being scripted and they don't have handcuffs, you know? I still think they should do that this day at every show. Um, you know, in between main event and raw, there's a 10 minute period, send somebody out there. You got three minutes and you don't tell anybody who, who, they're, who it is during the day. You just be like, uh, Xavier, uh, Xavier Woods, go out there for three minutes. What am I supposed to talk about? I don't know. And see what they got. And Woods would kill it, but give somebody else, right. Heath Slater or Kurt Hawkins or whoever you would see then who can do a promo and who can connect with the audience. You would get it right like that. Question before I go between uh, today's locker room versus uh, that Attitude Era locker room, mm-hmm. or when you came in '99. It was Attitude, attitude Era, yeah. So uh, uh, one of my big pet peeves, one of my big pet peeves, is when the announcer uh, backstage, whoever it is, whether it's male or females, talking to the talent, asks talent a question. Talent gives the answer. If there's an interrupt, there's an interrupt, but the talent gives the answer, and it's an awkward feeling. And then all of a sudden, it's back to Michael and the guys at the desk, and. The camera stays on the interviewer who's got this awkward answer. Or there's been some intended. You want there to be some heat there, and all of a sudden it's just an awkward reaction to the mm-hmm. person that's part of the broadcast team. It'd be like Aaron Andrews not throwing back mm-hmm. to the guys calling the game. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Because I think she should. I, I think whether it's a male or female, they should throw back to the announce team because I don't think the heat, the point, or anything goes anywhere because I'm so focused on that weird look that the interview ha- has on their face. And you can't look at the camera, so you're kind of just staring off into the distance. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I don't get it. Well, I mean, and and you know, I don't have to tell you this, and it's. You know, Pat Patterson said it best. It's like, you know, it's Vince's ice cream shop. And sometimes he likes chocolate and sometimes he likes vanilla and sometimes he likes neither one. It's his, it's his, it's his, it's his ice cream store. That's the way Vince wants it. In Vince's mind, that's how he wants it. So you have to work within those parameters. Do I think it's good? Not necessarily. I think the backstage interviewers now, could they be, and I say this respectfully because I know they're just doing what they're told, could they be more robotic? I loved that. I know it's 80s wrestling, as Vince would say, but the, the Gene Okerlund and Lee Marshall as well, who's passed away since, they were great. They were great at it because they would have some energy and like Gene would be like, oh, what are you talking about? You can't talk to me like right. that, Bobby Heenan. Oh, my God. Let's... And they would throw back. Right. It, it, there's a lack of energy sometimes to the show when you don't let people be themselves. Like, I'm a ham. You're a ham. I will... Scenery chew worse than William Shatner if you if you if you let me and if but even if you don't there's still a way to captivate even as right. that quiet talking heels if I talk quiet everyone has to shut up and listen to me I remember sometimes I do promos like that and people in the crowd would be like we can't hear you and then I'd go even quieter then you better fucking listen man <laughs> and that's like one person captivating a whole arena of people I find sometimes that guys aren't aren't given the opportunity to take that ball and run with it because it's very regimented the regimentation yeah. or the i don't know, i just feel like there there's a kind of everybody's walking on eggshells these days just because there's nowhere else to go and everybody's just micromanaged to a degree and this, i'm not indicting the system hell i'm gonna be up there on monday night raw for the 25th anniversary but uh it's just one of those things that just kind of mm-hmm. man from back in the day you know when i came in as a ringmaster, and I know it was a suck ass gimmick, right? But hell, I had a wife, two kids, you know, a log cabin on 10 acres. And shit, I got to pay my bills, they're going to take all my shit from me. Right. So I go up there. I'd already uh, went to visit Vince twice. I knew they didn't have anything planned for me. I knew they'd bring me as a mechanic. So shit, I didn't. I never came. Mm-hmm. Then finally, after I busted my arm, went to ECW, got under the learning tree of Paul Heyman. You know, I said, okay, it's time to go. Mm-hmm. You know, Vince said, oh, God, goddamn pal. We'll, we'll, we'll bring you in, a million-dollar champion, Ted DiBiase is your manager. And I love Ted, Ted DiBiase, mm-hmm. right? Of course. So anyway, so I came up. I knew that wasn't going to work after six months. And so that's when, you know, whatever. Started thinking about it and, you know, drinking beer, you know, whiskey, whatever it was, watching, you know, television. Came up with the, you know, the Stone Cold persona. Anyway, whoever came up with it came up with it. And that was my name. Uh, and when I went out there and, you know, I remember Scott Hall came up to me and he goes, 
because all of a sudden it was on the uh, back, backstage. Remember, they used to have boards there, mm-hmm. so and so versus so and so. They still do, yeah. yeah, they still do. So, uh, you know, Razor Scott sees it. Now I'm called Stone Cold Steve Austin. He goes, Stone Cold, man, what's that all about? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I didn't really have a definition of the gimmick of yet, but was, I, yeah. I I had a sense of where it was going to go and what I could do with it. I said, oh, man, I said, just, just give it time. I'm telling you, yeah, it'll work. Just watch. So anyway, I was I always went out there, dude. And, you know, when uh, I guess Russo was doing a book and he was on my show the other day, he says, you know, he, he had you know created the uh, opportunity for me to go ringside and do some color commentary. I went out there and did it. And, you know, that's when I noticed that they were, you know, they weren't. This is when we're going live tape live tape. yeah, yeah, yeah. they start editing on my shit and i talked with vince i said hey man why are you editing my stuff and he goes well quite frankly see if you're popping the guys in the truck you know and he wanted me to be a heel mm. but so anyway i told him right then and there i said dude i'm 6'1 250 ball head goatee you know 6'10 7 feet guys 300 320 i'm speaking fast because everybody's almost heard my story so many times i said if you give me my personality i said i i can you know i can compete if you take my personality from me i can't compete okay i've said that story many times i just told you my point is dude back in the day because there's still wcw there was still you know ecw hell i wasn't making no money mm-hmm. i was making you know the, the little bit of money one night a week working for paul so i didn't know what did i have to lose so finally you know every time i got a chance to go out there i didn't give a shit mm-hmm. i was gonna you know go out on a limb push the envelope do whatever it took because it didn't make a shit. Right. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Hey, man, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com. Get a quote and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. And it's funny because I just did this in Japan with the Alpha vs. Omega Loved thing. It. Where, thank you, but the the angle beforehand in Fukuoka a couple weeks before, then the press conference, then after the show I did another press conference. Yep. I didn't care. I was like, you know, I, I, I'm not a big dude, but over there, I'm a big guy. And I was thinking, I want to be like Bruiser Brody and Stan. I want to scare these guys, like these reporters and shit. They don't deal with that nowadays, but there was no rules. I was swearing. I was, you know, during the match, I grabbed the camera and took a picture of me flipping the bird to the crowd, took pictures of it. They that put that in the magazine, which like I came across as this like lunatic who could would do anything and didn't care, ripping up reporters' books and yelling at them and you know, throwing tables and threw a garbage can full of like cigarette butts in water on one of the reporters from Tokyo sports. He got covered in like cigarette butt water, but I'm like, you know, I don't care. I'm doing it. And everybody's flipping up Jericho, 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 Jericho. Cause there's no restrictions. And like you said, I didn't care. I might never come back here. I want to have some fun. I want people to know I'm different from any other foreign guy or any of the Japanese guy. I don't give a shit what the rules of Japan are. I don't care what the, you know, we went to a press conference in this very nice hotel. Like don't throw anything off. If the table costs a thousand dollars, I'll pay for it. But you're going to sell tickets because of it. And it was really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Gratifying and uh, whatever. There's a word for it. Where there was just this freedom after 17 years of having to have stuff approved by Vince or agents or whatever. I didn't have to have anything approved. I could do anything I wanted. And what a cool feeling that was. As far as the match goes, and I saw the build-up stuff. Liberating. That's what I was looking for. Sorry. Liberating. <laughs> but but I don't know if you remember the conversation. I, I told you. I said, dude. To me, you just look free out there. Yeah. I said exactly that. And yeah. that's what came across to me. I said, dude, 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 he doesn't give a shit. He's not being held back. He can do anything he wants. He's not. That's and, it. And, and like I said, there's not like, you know, there's a kind of a misconception in WWE that, that you get held back. And it's not getting held back, but there's certain rules that we have to abide by because that's the, like, you know, it's a corporate company now. There's no juice allowed, no chair shots. And thank goodness for that. I mean, I sent you that gif a couple months ago of you just wailing guys with chair shots. Did you think of how we used to do that? Mm-hmm. And you took them too. That was just part of the business. And to look back at that, it's so barbaric. It's like we're stabbing each other with like, like you know, maces or something. But there's certain things you just cannot do in the WWE. Correct. And to have the restrictions to, to do whatever you want. Like, okay, I want to 
Let's go through a table. Let's do it. You know, let's put up a chair. It's a no DQ match. That's why I wanted no DQ. Didn't want to bury the referee, even though everyone else does. I wouldn't feel good about that. You know, so we had the permission to do it. Let's use it. And not having to get it approved was kind of a cool yeah. feeling. But there being, you know, with the with the rule system being in place that, that is there now, there were rules back when I was running wild over there, right? Yeah. yeah. But you just push the envelope due to whatever the rule structure is. Mm-hmm. But just because, here's the thing, when, when you are limited, you know, physically or from, from a standpoint of picking up chairs, tables, this, that, or whatever, dude, I mean, you've seen matches inside the squared circle where no one left the ring and a, and a sum bitch just either goes haywire or goes off or the guy, the baby's got so much fire that heals such a piece of shit or that mean streak or whatever he's doing within, you know, mm-hmm. the stru- I'm talking about today's yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can get over. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's all about, and I was just like someone asked me that day, you know, it was a whole different conversation, but I said, man, you got to be a fighter. And, and whether you're a heel or a baby, you got to be a fighter to get over. And I don't mean to segue out of it, but people say, could Stone Cold Steve Austin get over in today's WWE? Absolutely. Hell yeah, he could. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hell that, yeah. That, that, same rules, same guy. That That's something that, like, I know Batista said something at one point of, like, it, it would be hard to get over him in the PG-13 environment or something along those lines. Dave's a great guy, and mm-hmm. I disagree with him because he could get over because a good worker is a good worker. And I don't care if it's Attitude Era or PG-13 or ECW or Lucha Libre. If you know what you're doing, you can incorporate any style or any rule that needs to be done and still get over. That's It's easy if you're good. I had, I had no problem switching from Attitude Era to PG-13. Zero. Stop saying son of a bitch. Stop yeah. saying jackass. You know, all that sort of stuff. And, and, you know, it was, wasn't that hard because I know what I'm doing. It's not that. But it's also, it's just delivery. It, it, Absolutely. It, yeah. And you know, not everything is content. Not yeah. everything. You ain't got to go out there and, and, and recite a rush, you know, yeah. lyrics yeah, 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 yeah. to get over. Yeah. And by the same token, in the structure of a match, you don't got to do a million moves and a bunch of whirly gigs and flips and shit off the top turnbuckle to get over. You don't, you know, and just to go back to what you're saying, and I, this is just something that I always have noticed. I don't think I've ever told it. It's not really much of a story, but I remember. I was in a tag team match one time with uh, Undertaker and he was on the apron side while we were getting heat on whoever we were getting heat on and a couple of false tags and he couldn't get in he could get in at one point he just he jumped on the floor he grabbed some water he poured it over his head he hit the damn uh, uh, steps like bam 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 he looked like he was going nuts and I was like people loved it because Who did why Undertaker. Okay. And why do you have to stand on the apron holding it? He was like, I'm, I'm a caged animal. I've got water and, and, and chaos and, and plunder around ringside. You knew he wanted this tag. Right. And he, everyone else would just stand there. Tag me, tag right. me, tag me. He was like, fuck it. I can't stand anymore. Yeah. I'm going to go crazy. Hit the damn thing. And you know he's ready to go. He's jumping up. Yeah. And this is Undertaker showing like a, a Brian Pillman 1989 yeah. baby face yeah, fire. Slap the mat. Like slapping yeah. the mat. And I just all, I always remember that. Of course, I tried it a couple times. I was never as good at doing it as Taker was. But just little things like that shows that is a true professional. He knows what he's doing. And there's no gimmick, dead man, anything of that. It's just a guy who knows he's connecting with the audience. He's letting people know, I want this tag. And I'm going to get this tag. And you guys know I'm going to get it. And everyone's like, yeah, you're going to get it. And when he got the tag, you know, it blew the roof off, as you can expect. But it was just that little extra little bit. I learned this in Mexico from a guy called Negro Casas who is the best, one of the best wrestlers I've ever worked with, not in Mexico, anywhere. They call him the Ric Flair of Mexico. He understands the psychology of where he is. He's not a flipper or a flyer. He's just, his details taught me that the difference between a good worker and a great worker is the little things. Really is. I agree. And, and if you know how to do those little things, you will transcend from good to great. But it's amazing how many guys don't know the little things. Well, that's why I was like, uh, and I was on YouTube the other day, and I was just looking at old random videos, and it was you, and this was so many years ago, because Dallas Page was still living in Playa Vista, and that's where I used to live with him when I first came out to Los Angeles, and you guys had went through a yoga workout, and y'all were talking about Eddie Guerrero. Mm, yeah, yeah, And you, know, you it was me and Eddie. Yeah. You know, you had that, that whatever, that meeting with him where you, you first met him, and he was grouchy, grouchy, but then he was the next drunk, day, yeah. super nice <laughs> Eddie. Anyway, and yeah. the guy was phenomenal, but... I don't mean to ramble. Eddie was one of those guys that if you knew anything about wrestling, 
you picked up on the little things he did. If you didn't know anything about wrestling from a technicality standpoint, just from watching him, for some reason it resonated with you at a deeper level because you were seeing a guy who was so detail oriented. The little things meant so much. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just something is even that little thing. If the ba if the baby face, let's say, baby face is laying on his back, face up, and it's just that little peel out on the damn face, you the know, kind on of the put forehead, his, put his heel and crush. It, Crush out a cigarette butt on your How forehead, many yeah. people do that? There's a couple that do it, but, who, but ain't nobody does it like no, Eddie. No, does it, but does it where it looks like he's he's putting out a cigarette also butt on your forehead with the stink yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, 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 with a little stink and on it. it. Just, but it's those little things that made Eddie so yeah, great. Yeah, Eddie was really, really good at that sort of stuff. And you know, like I was thinking about this the other day, man. I I I miss Eddie. I wish he was still around because he was such a goofball, but like just very, just a really good guy, obviously, but. He really took everything very personally. And you, we talked earlier about back in the day when we were running, we were a little bit nuts. Um, he went, never really went nuts. He took everything so personally. Like if the house was down like 200 people when he was a champion, he would be really legitimately sad. You know, if he heard one person booing him when he was supposed to be a baby face. Actually, you went through that phase too. I remember we had a match in El Paso of all places. We tore the house down and you were pissed off after. I said, what's wrong? He said, there was one guy on the front row. He's giving me the finger. I'm like, dude, there's 10,000 people chanting your name. But at the time, that yeah. bothered you. You yeah. couldn't get over it. Eddie was like that too. So involved and so into it that anything that he felt was a slight against him and his abilities, he would take it very, very personal. And that's why I don't think – I think he eventually would have gotten over it, but I don't think – the first time he was a champion, they didn't keep it on him long because I don't think he could take it. It's a lot of pressure to be the champion, and I think it kind of made him go a little bit crazy because of it, you know? It seemed to me as, as little as I knew Eddie, and I knew him a little bit. Mm -hmm. and I, Did you ever work with him? Yeah, okay. I, request, I requested to work with wow. him because I'd kind of been running hard, and I yeah, was kind yeah. of just getting caught up in – I, I want to work again. Yeah, you know, yeah, I don't yeah. want to rely on a gimmick, man. And, you right. know, Eddie was a worker. Mm -hmm. He was a worker's worker. And so I requested to work with him. And after about a week's worth of shows, they pulled us apart because they needed me to work with. Yeah, whoever you know, was on top or whatever. Yeah, yeah, someone on top. But I requested to work with a guy. And I uh, met as many guys as we both know that have gone down. I, I did not a big funeral guy. Mm -hmm. I went to Eddie's funeral. I remember that. I remember that. Yeah, and I remember I, seeing I, just, you there. I went there. It surprised me because I remember you had talked about that before. Not being a funeral when, guy. When I, uh, I want to get to you. Uh, I want to get to uh, a match with you and Shawn Michaels. But uh, you mentioned earlier. Um, no, I, I was thinking earlier about Brian Pillman when I was thinking about you as far as your freedom in that match against Kenny Omega. And he didn't just say, "Oh, that's Brian Pillman." I just mm. it just it resonated. Man, he's he's in the zone. Mm. He's really free. But then also just talking about Eddie Guerrero. Uh, it would be great if Brian was still around. And. That guy was so far ahead of his time, just from a gimmick standpoint. Remember back in the day, you know, when you would run with a guy and we were tagging, and you're on the road with a guy for three weeks, you know, it's kind of like, okay, man, when I go home for these two days, I just want to chill out and not hear from anybody. Man, there's Brian calling me, mm -hmm. kid, got a scoop. It was always good to hear from him. Uh, so he's a guy that I, that I wish was still around. I guess the point, the thing I'm getting to, a lot of guys get lost on the road into a bunch of shit. I hung out with the drinking crowd. I kind of was the drinking crowd. If it wasn't nobody else, you know, that's that's just kind of what I did. How did you get away or stay away from just the, the gamut of pills that a lot of guys fall into? Because some of the guys that I've talked to, survivors like Del Wilkes, Del Wilkes, the Patriot, and, you know, guys that are telling me, man, I'm taking 40 to 60, you know, mm -hmm. Oxycontins Gimmicks, or yeah. Percocets or whatever. I'm like, I don't understand that. I don't know how you do it. I mean, because – Back in the day, dude, a couple of cups, a couple of pots of coffee, rather, two bikes, I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take any pain pills if I was hurt. I mean, when I broke those bones in my back, I had a doctor, you know, shooting me up with Toradol before I went out there every night. My point is, I just didn't go down that road. I didn't get lost in it. How did you stay away from it, or did you not? I I, I don't really know the answer to that. I just know, like, when I when I grew up, you know, in the 80s, I started wrestling in 90. This might sound really dumb, but whatever. At the time, it was really still say no to drugs. That was, was what was hammered into our heads when I was in high school, a teenager. Yep. Say no to drugs, don't do drugs, don't do drugs, don't do drugs. And some guys that I knew smoked a little weed and stuff, but I just never was interested. Don't do drugs. I don't want to do drugs. I don't know why would I want to do drugs. And I just never 
started with that. I never did any of the pills, even back in Calgary and Mexico. Guys that I would hang with would be doing all the pills. I just didn't, didn't. I don't know why. I, I still to this day, I've never done cocaine in my life. Never. I just never had the desire to, for whatever reason. Um, Dude, out of all your years in the once. music scene that you're involved nope. in, turn with Fives never and Worldwide, once. wrestling, yeah. all the... Dude, yeah. there was a couple of stops where there would be, you know, <laughs> there would be the, the, yeah, the, the guy I mean, with the gimmicks. I, I went through, the, you know, I did shrooms and that yeah, sort of no props scene to you, and dude. that sort of thing, yeah. but I just never... For whatever reason, but I just liked having a drink, and yeah, yeah. the guys that I ran with just liked having a drink. I remember we used to, Raven will tell you this too. We used to have this this gang that we called us the Drunken Four Horsemen, and it was me, Raven, Kurt Hanning, and Mongo McMichael. Now I don't know if Mongo and Kurt knew that was the name, but it was always the four of us hanging out. And we were called the Drunken Four Horsemen. That's what me and Raven called each other. And there was never drugs with those guys. It was just drinking. Here's how you gargle Jack Henning. Here's how you gargle Jack Daniels, kid, and fool people. You you let it dribble out the side of your mouth and let some other sad sack gargle Jack Daniels, which will kill you. Anybody that's listening, it will kill you. Like it will get you super drunk. And uh, and McMichael, I remember he broke his arm one time and he drank a bottle of Jack and started hitting his broken arm. Listen to this. Hitting his arm on the damn table. Like, what are you doing? Oh, it doesn't hurt. Um, those were the guys that I had fun with. So it was never a pill atmosphere. Um, and I, for whatever reason, and then, and then when I got to the point where I didn't have to worry about peer pressure or anything, I just made the decision. I'm not going to bother. I'm not gonna, even in ECW. Nobody ever approached me to do it. You know, I don't know. It just never kind of came my way. I remember just, just to finish off when I did break my arm in Smoky Mountain Wrestling uh, and I came, I broke it earlier in the day trying a shooting star press because somebody, Ultimo Dragon, convinced me I could do one. And of course, I had no idea what I was doing. Tried one earlier in the day, broke my arm, went to the hospital, came back. We had a big show. It was the semi-main event of this sold-out thing that Cornette had. It was me and Lance against the Heavenly Bodies, Jimmy Del Rey and Dr. Tom. I worked the match with a broken arm. Dr. Tom, they were taking one-arm body slams from me. Those guys were so good to do that for me. But I remember they gave me some pills, whatever the pain pills were for having a broken arm, and uh, I didn't take them. I remember uh, Brian Lee was really concerned. Are you okay, man? Are you all right? Did you get any pain pills? <laughs> yeah, here, take them. <laughs> so I had a broken arm and never took pain pills. Who does that? A plate in my arm. You can still see the scar to this day. Just decided I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to fall down that path. So, and here I am. That's good for you. I'll tell you what, because there was a lot of shit going on back in the day, and Mm -hmm. we we had our stops. It was a good time. Uh, One last uh, Kurt Henning story. The thing (laughs) with Kurt was when when, uh, he was in WWF or when we were in WCW or vice versa, whichever one, for some reason, you know, Kurt was a legend. Yeah. A living legend. Among the boys, he was just beloved because he's always in a good mood. He's always up to hijinks. He was a world-class worker, highly charismatic, a ton of fun. If he was having a bad day, I don't think anybody would ever know. Yeah. But when you cross paths with Kurt, you had to do a shot of Jack with him. You had to gargle it. (laughs) That was the rule. (laughs) And so, man, I'd be, you know, like it happened to me twice. I'm walking through an airport, man. I got my sunglasses on. I'm pretty haggard. And, you know, I'm saying, there's Kurt. You know, (laughs) you got to gargle a shot with him. Come on. Have a shot. (laughs) Yeah, that was the deal. Yeah. Hey, before we leave, because I know I want to do your podcast. I want to leave time for that. Uh, That match with uh, Shawn Michaels, it got match of the year. It was a ladder match. It was in 2008. What Russell, was that WrestleMania? No, No, it uh, was uh, No Mercy. It was in October of 2008. Jesus Christ. I remember, I probably remember watching it back in. I don't know if I'd taken my ball and went home because I wasn't even on the card. I was on the card. I don't think you were there at the time. But Jesus Christ, I watched that match before you came over, uh, before I scanned through some of your facts. But uh, real quick, on, on a comparison, that match, Kenny Omega, obviously two different things uh, on your list of accomplishments. Well, I, I know you're proud of the fact that you drew money in Japan. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Buy rates, subscriptions, and all that with, with Omega. Yeah. But that drew money too. The, the no, Michaels, okay, Jericho, so, but, so. I, but I just thought you know the way you. No, I, no, but I was earlier with Bully Ray. I was like, okay, I didn't know if, if you had a, a grudge or a no, chip or whatever. No, I was like, not, this was a, that that ladder up, match was so awesome. Up until the Omega match. And it's still, I don't know, but, but if people ask me what's your favorite match, I'd always say the latter match with Sean. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. I think, A, this is being completely biased, but also just saying how I feel. It kills the Sean Razor ladder match. It blows it out of the water. But it wasn't as monumental because that was the first one. Um, another reason why I love it 
is because it was the culmination of a seventh month, seven month feud that was supposed to go one day. It started when Batista and Sean had a match, and I was the guest referee. And Sean, the idea was Sean would hurt his knee. I would wave off the match, and then we would find out later on that Sean was faking it. And I knew he was faking it, but he would claim that he wasn't. And then it would lead to a match that we would work each other. Sean would win the end. Um, but Sean is so good. His original idea was, was there'd be some kind of a finish and then we'd have a match. And then Sean was like, no, this is too, we can do something with this. We'd worked at WrestleMania 2003. You and Rock worked that night um, in Seattle. And we had great chemistry. And he's like, this is a waste to do this and just pay it off with one one show, one pay-per-view. And I remember we asked Vince, this is a classic Vince uh, question and answer. What do you want for the finish? And Vince goes, I don't know. I just booked the shit. You guys figure it out. All right. And then Sean came up with this idea where he tweaks his knee. I believe him. Am I the fool? Is he the fool? And we started this big, long angle that went through all these shapes and phases. And uh, we had uh, the first match was a real technical match. The second one was the match where Vince decided there was no more blading because he gigged so hard. You go back, he's bleeding everyone. After that, Vince says, no more blading. That was at the time when he was thinking about it. Done. And then we had, uh, then we were going to pay it off at SummerSlam. And Sean said, it's not good enough because we have this great chemistry. We're the edge and taker. And there was Hunter and somebody. We're going to be third. You know, Sean will be third or fourth on the bill at best. I'm not going to waste that. <laughs> or whatever, whatever he said. I love his attitude. When great it's attitude, yeah, man. And then he had the idea, well, why don't, why don't I say I'm going to retire? Because I'd done something where I dropped tail holding him into the corner of a desk and he sold that his eye was all messed up. And the thing is, his eye really started to go a little bit cross-eyed. People think it's because of that. Look at, you see Sean now, he's got a little bit of a wonky eye. Yeah. People think it's from that angle. It's not. So he had the idea of bringing in his wife. And then he would say, everybody, I'm retiring. But I came down to spoil his retirement ceremony. I go to punch him. He zigs. I zag. I punch his wife in the face for real, by the way, which was awful. But she was okay, and in, the, in hindsight, it made it real. Everybody in the bill was like, listen, this wrestling stuff, I don't know, is it showbiz or not? If someone punched my old lady the way that, I would kill this guy. My aunt, my, my mom, my sister took a different So anyways, long story short, we finally got to the ladder match for the world championship in the main event. It was never supposed, this feud was never supposed to be for the title. But I got so hot off it, and Sean got so hot off it, it became a world title angle. And that's why I love that ladder match because A, it was a great match and B, the story to get there was one of the greatest angles in WWE history. The Steve Austin Show. The Steve Austin Show. Support for this podcast comes from Pluto TV. Need an escape? Drop into Pluto TV for a world of free TV. Stream hundreds of channels and thousands of movies and shows all for free. Yeah, free. No subscriptions, no fees. Imagine 24-7 channels of Narcos, CSI, Star Trek, Survivor, and everything else from hit movies to binge-worthy TV shows, the latest news, live sports, comedy, and more. What are you waiting for? Download the free Pluto TV app for Android, iPhone, Roku, and Fire TV and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in. Watch free. But how long had you had that title going into that feud? Was that the... I won the title once again. It, it all tied in. And this is classic Vince booking. I punched Sean's wife in the face. Then we have to do an unsanctioned match, which means whatever happens, the WWE is not held liable for any of this. And it was basically a street fight. That, that, that table bump I took in Alpha vs. Omega, I got from the Sean right. sanction where he hits me with a chair. I fall off the corner through the table that I've set up earlier. Um, and he beat the shit out of me. He killed me. And the finish was... He just beat me. He beat me up. He beat right. me to submission. They rang the bell. Off. He came back, beat me up some more, beat me up some more, whipped me with the belt, hit me with this cowboy boot. I was beat the fuck up. Right. Then, guess what happens? The last match on the show is a scramble match, a five way match. CM Punk gets beaten up. Who's the fifth guy? Me. I come in, get the shit kicked out of me by everybody. And it's one of these things where you could win the title, win the title, win the title. And whoever has it at the end, hot potato wins. And Batista uh, is the champion. And he. Power bombs Kane, and I roll Batista up. One, two, three. Bell hits zero. I'm the champion. So I walk out of there as a champion. Okay, okay. Even though Sean had beat the shit out of me. So right. that led us to the ladder match. See, with it, going into that, and I didn't know the whole buildup, but it was just an awesome match. And the thing I liked about the match was it was so smart. Mm. Because you've seen so, – and first of all, the, the first ladder match between Razor and Sean or whoever else had one in a yeah, small yeah, territory. Yeah. I don't right. know. Okay, right. so we're talking about WWF. Mm-hmm. 
So we had to raise a Sean Massey. Then the way you guys started this thing out, you started putting the work in, solid work. But it was just laid out in such a, an intelligent fashion. You're using the ladder as a weapon. You're using it as a means to an end to try to get to the belt. But you didn't do everything from the top of the ladder. And so I like the fact that it was so ground-based and using the scissor action, using pivot points, uh, the, the spot, you know, in the, yeah. in the corner, uh, coming out of the uh, figure four, which he reversed on you, and then you kicked the, the, the ladder the into his face. Yeah. I mean, his sell job on that. Oh, you know, that one bump where, where you're climbing to the top and, you know, you, you pinned him. You pinned yeah. him. You're climbing to the top. And Jesus Christ, he's got to watch you ascend to the top of the ladder now and get this damn belt. You become the champion and he's helpless. You take a mega bump. That was a masterful bump. I mean, yeah. you, you, you do things like that. And there are several other instances as well, uh, great bumps that were uh, done from a, a high angle and on top of the ladder. Uh, which are extremely high risk, and you guys both stayed safe. I don't know how you felt uh, after the match, you can tell me. But I just like the scissor action, using it as a weapon. You know you need to climb it. But the Hardy Boys, uh, Chris and Edge, Dudley's, you know, all those guys have, have unbelievable matches. Yeah. This was a match that would, out of all of and they've all been, for the, for the most part, they've all been spectacular. This was one of the best ever. Well, I appreciate that. And actually, the idea of that was to not... You can't compete with the Hardys and Edge and, and Trish and those guys. Let's use the ladder as a weapon. Uh, it's something that actually... There's another great ladder match I had against Benoit. Royal Rumble in New Orleans 2001. Uh, that's the first time I ever did the Walls of Jericho on the ladder. It's a yeah. famous moment. But our idea was, let's just... It's a ladder. Let's use it as a weapon. Let's not even climb this thing. Took the same concept with Sean. After all we've done... We need to just beat each other up with this ladder. And instead of thinking of ways to take bumps off it, let's look at ways to take bumps using it. Um, and that's why it worked because you have to think this is a seven month, this is a literal blood feud. Like even at the unsanctioned match, even though he beat me, Sean was still crying at the end because he still couldn't erase the pain he went through from punching his wife. Um, so you had to make it violent and real. Another thing about this is, dude, that hit me in the, I lost half a tooth I saw that. and that's real. I mean, and that horrible thing to lose your teeth in the ring. But once again, I remember when it came on, I looked up and I smiled and I had half a tooth. And I remember I, I thought to myself, I look like the ghost of Benoit it kind of freaked me out. But to see that, um, that made it real. And the next night on, I, I didn't go to the dentist the next day because I wanted to go on raw the next night and show the world that I had lost Half a tooth. I look like uh, Jim Carrey in Dumb and Dumber. And, you know, I want to show people this is this is what happened. Yes, I won, but this is the price I paid for real. This is not a gimmick wrestling thing. I lost half a freaking tooth that I still might lose at some point because they said it might rot and die because the root got messed up too. But that to me, you have these happy accidents. You know, Alpha vs. Omega, I got my lips split, so I'm spitting blood. It just makes it that much more. It's the classic Austin Brett double turn. If you hadn't got the color on that hold when he had you in the sharpshooter it wouldn't have been the same and obviously you did that getting color but still it needed it the half the tooth the whole thing it made it a classic classic match with all of the elements that happened in spite of the match and because of it i didn't know the finish of the match because like i said i remember watching it but as we were talking before we hit the sound the record button dude i've forgotten so much shit it's unbelievable yeah and that's just life right sure sure, of course of course of course to finish that match, I'm thinking, God damn, it's where Sean's going to get the belt. And you retained. Yeah. And it was an unbelievable finish. And then preceding that, you know, when you were hanging from the, you know, when you hooked your leg in the rungs of the, the ladder and you were hanging upside down. And a couple of times when y'all had taken them, there was just a couple of bumps using that ladder. And the times you draped yourself over in the corner. But going to the finish, who came up with that finish? I can't remember. Dude, because you started sliding down that thing. I yeah, mean, he's going to let go. We, we were can't hang we on. were having a tug of war for the for yeah. the for the title. Uh, he had one end of it. I had the other end. And we were both pulling. I almost fall down, and then I kind of come up and push it into his face. So he gets hit with the belt. He falls off. See, the thing I loved about this is that Sean and I worked together to come up with that whole angle with Brian Gewertz, as you would call him as well. And Michael Hayes and Vince was involved too. But every week we'd show up, what, where are we going to go with this? There was never a seven month plan. It was a week by week. What can we do this week to make it cool? So Sean and I worked so it's like Lennon McCartney. I don't know what part of the song Paul wrote, the song Lennon wrote. It was just a team effort. So I'm not sure exactly who came up with it, but I do know at that point in time, we were both 
what about this? How about that? What about this? How about that? So it's probably something that both of us came up with together. I would say that was probably a little bit more Sean, because as you know, Sean was losing. So Sean was always going to make sure he's coming up with something that's great. He's not just going to fall flat. Oh, yeah. He, you know, especially at the end. Because he cares. Because he cares. And yeah. then, once again, he's losing this big blood feud that was involving his family. Yeah. So it was just, once again, that's, that's the thing when you do ladder matches now. So much stuff has been done. What can you do that's never been done before? And just the psychology and the drama. Of that, like that's what I loved about that. It, 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 one more little thing is we had a ladder match, uh, Money in the Bank ladder match last year. I think at SummerSlam or something. It was me, Owen, Zane, Cesaro, Del Rio, uh, Ambrose. That's a good match. It's a good match. But here's what happened: those guys started getting so obsessed with like you got to get power bombed on the ladder and you got to fall off the top of the Titan Tron because if we don't do something right. cool, no one's gonna buy it. And I just sat there listening and I threw in. And finally, at one point, I just went. It's like uh, Tom Hanks, Captain Phillips. Hey, I'm the captain now. Everything now is going to be decided on and approved by me. If anybody here has any problems, go tell Vince you got a problem with because I know who he's going to side with. You guys are way off base. This is not what a ladder match is about. A ladder match is about this. Climbing, climbing, reaching, reaching, knock down, climbing, climbing. That's all it is. You want to take bumps on the ladder? Go ahead. Not on my watch, not on my match. And we put it together using the drama of the ladder match. And it turned out to be a hell of a contest. It was a great match. And afterwards, I remember Sammy Zane was like, man, you know, you were right. It's like, of course I'm fucking right. Listen to me, you know. One of the best feelings I ever had in, uh, in all of my years in the business was passing out in a sharpshooter in Chicago, double turn. And I laid there in a pool of blood. I didn't have to do anything after that, but stun the referee while Shamrock and Bret Hart would do a little bit of uh, physicality to further the storyline. And I remember just laying there in a pool of blood, and I was just like, God damn, man, we just hit a grand slam. Mm -hmm. No, shit, man, there was five people on base, not just three. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of, and I was just laying there. When you guys both tumble down, you know, and it's over and everything comes across. I mean, I, I love the match because the calls were protected. The calls that were made mm -hmm. were all protected, but there wasn't a whole lot of communication. Everything mm -hmm. was tight. Everything looked great. Everything came off like, like it should have, or if, if it didn't, you covered. What are you feeling at the end of uh, Alpha Omega when that's over? What are you feeling? And you, you, you drew money. You fill that house up. Are you just your sense of satisfaction from an accomplishment standpoint? Shawn Michaels ladder match. You're laying there. The match is over. Well, I, I mean, know what it was for me. Well, what do you feel? I mean, I've always been the type of guy where, as soon as the bell rings for the finish of the match, I know if it was good or bad to me. I don't need anyone else to tell me. I don't have to go on social media and look up if it was good or bad. I don't need everyone wants you know a compliment from let's say even Vince. Oh, sure. I don't need it. I know if he says it's great and I didn't believe it. I don't care if he, if he says it sucked and I thought it was great. I can only judge what I feel. But there's those certain nights, and it's something that we all tried for in the business, even with Fozzy, when you, have a, when you, have, when you do a live show. It, you hit the jackpot only once in a while, uh, and that's why it's a special night. And both those matches were very special feelings. Now, the Sean one was a little worse because I had half a tooth, mm -hmm. and I was still spitting out pieces of my tooth. So you don't even think about that out there. You just think like, wow, what a match. What a great contest. Amazing. Um, the Omega one, I think uh, there was just, I played real pitch man in that. I wanted to sell tickets. And everything I did leading up to it was selling tickets, selling tickets, selling subscriptions, selling subscriptions. So the match is almost like, okay, I'll worry about the match when I get there. But when the match is coming closer, now I get that nervousness because you know, I'm 47 years old, right? And there's a lot of, experts going well he's never going to keep up with Kenny Omega and they're not going to even do anything it'll be smoke and mirrors and it'll be fine but come on Jericho's 47 I don't think that I'm 47 I never feel that way I never realized it I said 47 who me let me check my driver's license wow I'm 47 but I know I know who I am as a performer and once again I came in we met up a couple of days before. I came in with the finish of the match. I came in with the beginning. Kenny had the whole middle. We had a couple little details, switches and stuff. We left. A couple of days later it was the show. Changed a couple of things. And do we had it. I knew it was going to be great because of what was set up. What you don't know is, once again, the middle things. Grabbing the camera, sticking it up, uh, 
you know, there was one point where we were going to do a move. Someone else did it earlier. Let's just think of it out there. Kenny puts the table on me, jumps off the, the scaffold, gives me a double foot stomp on the table. That was just all improv. That stuff makes you like, when you improv and it's working, you get off on it. Now, it's the Tokyo Dome, so the sound goes up. I don't know, like, people aren't really aren't reacting to it. And as a performer, you know, it's like, man, this is good, but the crowd's not really into it. You watch it back, they're going nuts, but you can't hear it in the ring. It's like a WrestleMania in a stadium. So I knew it was good at the end, but I didn't expect it was going to get the, the type of reviews and feedback that it got. But just on a personal level, like you said, before all that shit comes in, I mean, mm. you know you went out there, you gave yeah, everything yeah. you had, and every, everything comes out aces. Mm-hmm. I mean, to me, and the same thing with uh, 17 with Rock and uh, the Astrodome. You know, tw- 25 minutes was a heel turn. You yeah. Know, I beat the f- out him with that chair, you know, and good color and all that stuff. And, you know, I was turning heel. If I can go back and do it again, I'd call an audible, say, Vince, yeah, watch a stunner. Yeah. I've already said that. And you're right. But yeah. just, just walking around, even before going in, into that match, dude, no nerves, no nothing. I knew the mission. I was going to get it done. And do we just, we, we blew the roof off, mm. off that place. But that, laying in that pool of blood, or just, and dude, in any house show, but on the biggest stage, mm. like the stage that you were just on, to me, dude, the satisfaction level, when yeah. you crushed it, validates all all the I mean, first of all we love to be on the road we love to be in the ring but you know, all the bullshit that you go through but man to be out there to be able to perform do something that you love and then to crush it is the best it's the best of which you know it's funny and and this is something that Ken and I were laughing about when when we talked about it the next day was there were some things in the match I don't even have to tell you that didn't go the way they were supposed to and that's what you focus on because you don't know like until you see it back and and it's like it didn't even it made it even maybe even better yeah. but at the time you're like where the was the referee what the fuck was he doing so i'm always thinking about that but then when i came through and actually the first guy i saw was tiger hattori longtime new japan referee one of the one of the office guys there he came up to me he was almost crying oh that was so good man thank you man I'm like really you thought it was like oh the best match like really wow and then someone else comes over and someone else i'm like these guys think this is like the best and then Meltzer, this is the best match of your career i'm like wow so now I'm feeling even better about it. But when I came out of it, I enjoyed it. But I was too busy thinking about the things that didn't work, not yeah. realizing that in retrospect, it made it even better. But we, I knew what we had. And I knew I'd never touched Kenny except for that beat down in Fuku. We never had a match together. I never had a match with Shawn Michaels before WrestleMania uh, 2003, whatever number that was, 1819. Sometimes you just get in there with somebody and you got that chemistry. Uh, and it's just... Phew, Easy, easy, easy. Everything of the match was smooth. It was crisp. Um, like I said, man, I, I can't even think now anything that I would change. There's one thing that I would change, but that's just being a real super stickler. But other than that, it was it was a great, great night. Before we ride off in the sunset, I know you're out here in Los Angeles promoting something. So I wanted you to talk about what you're out here promoting. Yeah, man. And then also talk about where people can find your podcast. Yeah, it's um, – so there's a show that I did called But I'm Chris Jericho. And I came up with this idea back in 2005 when I got burned out from wrestling. I left. And I came out to L.A. not to become a movie star, but to study acting. And I would go into these auditions where there'd be like 15 people that look kind of like me. And you'd be doing one line for CSI Sheboygan, like these pretzels are making me thirsty. And then they go, "Okay, thanks. And I'd be like, that's it. Like, I'm Chris Jericho. Like, I have a fan base. I have a name value. They didn't give a shit. You know, they didn't care. And I was like, what would happen if I got blackballed out of wrestling? And I had to get into acting and I had no steam and I had to start from the bottom. So I came up with this idea, but I'm Chris Jericho and uh, kind of a, a curb your enthusiasm style Seinfeldian type thing where I'm playing myself an exaggerated version. But what would happen if, you know, if I got, like I just said, so it took me eight years to sell it. And I sold it back in 2013 to a Canadian company. Uh, and it did really good. Won a bunch of film festivals, one LA film festival, one, one in France. And like, we had a bunch of momentum and then that's it. It's done. About a year ago, CBC, who's the biggest network in Canada called me and wanted to do season two. So in season two, Chris now is the fourth lead on star crusaders, a really kind of shitty sci-fi show, but he's still pissed off. I over-exaggerated prima donna version of myself. And it was so much fun to play because I can play a real dick who always, it's like Archie Bunker. I always get screwed in the end. Yeah. And I mean, we had Kevin McDonald and Scott Thompson from the kids in the hall. We had Andy Kindler from uh, Bob's Burgers is in it. And like all these great performers. Um, and it's really, really funny. And I had a really good time doing it. And because um, it's fun to play a, a version of yourself that you don't usually get to do. You know, like people think, oh, Chris Jericho is going to be the hero and he's got to be. No, this is the opposite. He's just a prima donna 
always kind of angry and it's just a really fun show that gave me a chance to as you know we had, we love comedy it gave me a chance to show this comedic skills that I've learned over the years uh, on on kind of the big screen. So when's that going to be on? It's on right now. It's but okay. I'm Chris Jericho dot com season two, and you can if you go there, you see season one, season two, and season one is like f- ten bite size, ca- uh, you know, episodes. But season two is a, a story arc. You start at the beginning, go all the way through to the end. So it's been a big hit, man. Like I said, it's a good way to kind of do something else other than just always wrestling and rock and roll. Dude, what's that? What happened to? There's nothing happening here. What, what, what's it called? Nothing to report. Nothing to yeah. report. Jesus Christ. That, I called you. That's so, it was yeah. so, I loved it. It was so hokey. It was wonderful. The same idea. Because there was nothing going on. In the same vein. That was two guys, two cops yeah. uh, and a stakeout where nothing ever happened. Just kind of talking about their own personal problems. That should have went somewhere. Dude, it was, um, it was uh, uh, for Comedy Central. And um, it was right when their whole infrastructure kind of went to shit. We got caught kind of like, you know, they switched bookers right in the middle of it. Hey, buddy. Callie's making a pair yeah, of shoes. Uh, uh, your black lab. Maybe smells my black lab. But, um, yeah, we, we wanted to do something with it. It did so good. And Comedy Central just kind of dropped the ball on it. But it's fun to do those things. And the thing is, nowadays, with, with you know, digital, it's on demand. People, like, it's like, is it on TV? It doesn't have to be. Right. You watch it whenever yeah, you yeah. want, you know. So, yeah, but I'm ChrisJericho.com. Check it out, and you'll have a couple laughs, and it's a lot of fun. All right, man. Uh, you got your podcast. You're done two a week now. Yeah, two week talk is Jericho on the Westwood One uh, Radio Network, which is really cool. Just made a move over there, and um, you know, still doing the same thing I do. Keep it diverse. Uh, something that you said when we first started doing this, like it's not my competition, and what I want to be is 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 Corolla and Joe Rogan and and Hardwick and those guys, and that's kind of the shows that I do. Some weeks it's wrestling, some weeks it's rock and roll, some weeks it's comedy, some weeks it's paranormal, whatever I find interesting. So it's been going really good, man. And last question, what's up with Ozzy? Are you on the road making music right now? Uh, well, Judas went top five yep. for 10 weeks, biggest hit of our career. Um, we sold, I just found we sold like over 100,000 singles, which is this That's day and awesome. age, might as well be yeah. like a million. Second single is Painless. That comes out this week. It's already gone top 40. I'm hoping that goes top 10, maybe even top five again, number one. We go out with Steel Panther in Europe January 28th. And then we uh, play here in the States uh, February 20th. We start. We're doing the whiskey here on March 10th. If no you're shit, around. dude. Uh, give, yeah. give me a yell for you coming to town because I'll, I'll come check you out. I'm joining. It'll be we'll fun, do a man. podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> Sorry, there's, gotta, there's gotta be a deal. It's like Bailey said. Let's, let's do a deal where we just hang out and shoot the shit. We've done, we've done the podcast now. You're gonna do mine after. Uh, and yeah, so we, now we, we got the podcast out of the way. We, we can got, just hang out. We got the podcast out of the way. Callie's ruthless. We're gonna try to keep her silent on yours because <laughs> you actually are a professional. I don't really give a shit. <laughs> it's all for free. Chris Jericho. Uh, Awesome guy. We're out. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Hey, man, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com. Get a quote and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. All right, sports fans, Podcast One has two great new shows for you to check out. Seven-time NBA champ Robert Ory is bringing big guests and great NBA commentary on the Big Shot Bob Pod. The Brooklyn Nets remind me of Oklahoma Sooner football, and we got to have to outscore you every time, and that's what the Brooklyn Nets are. Hey, you got Steve Nash at the helm. You got Dan Tony. They ain't thinking about no defense. And Eric Bowling and Brett Favre come together for Bowling with Favre. Everything from sports to politics to business and culture. Any uh, insight on what Aaron plans to do in, in Green Bay? What I read into his comments were simply frustration. Nothing more than that. Subscribe now to the Big Shot Bob Pod and Bowling with Favre on the Podcast One app, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And rate and review the shows on Apple for your chance to be featured.